why these grassroots initiatives are important and they humanize the other. So although they may be small and, and that sort of thing, and maybe our capacity is, is not a very large one, that they still allow opportunities to see the other as a human, which really changes the paradigm um, in, in your interaction. Uh, but I want to talk, uh, when it comes to my work, I want to focus more on the kind of the backdrop uh, behind a lot of what fuels my work and serves to guide me in a lot of what I do. Um, you mentioned I work as an independent contractor, so I work with a lot of different entities, organizations, grassroots in initiatives, in addition to institutions um, and some of the embassies in the D.C. area. So I've really been able to see an interesting um, kind of collaborative development or, or kind of cross-cutting of these different initiatives and how they affect different communities on a lot of different levels. Um, and and I, I want to begin by talking about the importance of perception and perceptions being very important in that they dictate the course of our interactions with other people. And these preconceived notions and labels that we put on people dictate how we interact towards them and treat them. And although they may be wrong perceptions, or, or we may feel that they don't accurately describe us, we have to realize that people's perceptions do shape their narratives and reality and backgrounds. And these perceptions are very powerful. I, I got an email many years ago, and it really has stuck with me over the years, and it was called The Power of Punctuation. And I don't have a, a slide, so I'm going to try my best to describe it. But it was an English professor who wrote the word, and I'm going to say this, try to say this about uh, punctuation, but a woman without her man is nothing, on the chalkboard. And they asked their students to punctuate this. Now the males in the class wrote, a woman without her man is nothing. Now you can imagine the women in the class wrote, a woman, Without her, man is nothing. <laughs> it's the same phrase. However, looked at from different perspectives, it's something completely, completely different. So people, and this has stuck with me because it really reminds me that people, although they are looking at the same thing, they have a different takeaway. And, you know, we have to understand that takeaway because it does shape our reality and our perspective. We cannot ignore that people are coming to things from different angles. So how do you really engage that? How do you uh, work with that different reality and, and, and really engage in this type of work? And you know, we are currently in a postmodern world of meta narratives, And we have to remember that everybody's truth is relative and everybody does have their own truth. So that really fuels a lot of what I do in my approach to cross-cultural communication and cultural diplomacy because oftentimes we have this kumbaya approach where you know, everyone means well, yeah, they mean well, but they're coming at it from a completely different angle. So their well and my well may be two different things. So that becomes really important in the exchange of ideas and you know, communications and cross-cultural diplomacy um, implies that communication and respect <laughs> between cultures becoming talked about is something that is involved in that. Now the potential for such improved knowledge is to enable improved interaction and cooperation. But I'm always one that digs a little deeper and questions what is the quality of its improved communication? What are the different forms that it takes on? And how can we really assess the value of cross-cultural and cultural diplomacy in general? Namely with who our target audience is, who does our message reach, but more so something that you brought up, really what is the takeaway? What is the follow-up? And what, you know, people come to these events, they leave, they go back to their ordinary life. What type of implementation is going on in this? Now I want to talk specifically about diplomacy and, and say that there are a lot of different types of diplomacy. You know, there's cultural diplomacy, citizen diplomacy, political diplomacy, social diplomacy, something we're increasingly seeing a lot more of now, but sports diplomacy. And using these different initiatives to try to get the same underlying theme, which is engaging and promoting exchange. But the type and the quality of engagement and exchange does differ from these different perspectives. Now I want to say, talking about Dean, I also feel that I really came to what I do in a post-9-11 world. Uh, and I always joke and say that you know, Muslims in a post-9-11 world have become like petting animals in the zoo. In the sense that you know, every time we cough or we sneeze, it, it becomes a Muslim woman cough, a Muslim man sneeze. So we're defined by our religion. And I, I long for the day that I pick up the New York Times and I read that a white Anglo-Saxon middle-aged man uh, fed children at the soup kitchen. You know, so until we, and although it is great, but we have to realize that sometimes talking about these initiatives does embed and perpetuate a sort of a stereotype, and that these Muslims that are doing this are out of the ordinary. So although we are getting great publicity for a lot of the work that we are doing, and a lot of these forms are talking and talking about the engagement with Muslim communities, namely, 
we have to realize that this is also in a platform of well, why is this important? Why does it matter that a Muslim woman is, is feeding homeless children at the shelter? Does my religion have to be talked about in that context uh, versus not? So in essence, I'm not self-ascribing as a Muslim. I, I'm being told uh, that that is an important attribute of my identity that is newsworthy of talking about. And the reason I bring up Islam again is uh, that's a lot of my focus area. But uh, you know, first and foremost, I want to say that when we talk about Islam, uh, that we have to really differentiate between Islam as a religion, as Muslims as followers of that religion. And secondly, we have to realize that Islam is not only a religion, but Islam, Islam is also a culture and a social, it's a social reality and a cultural reality. And within those ethnic and subgroups that exist, there are also subgroups of those subgroups. And as you said, this becomes a lot more complex than merely, you know, let's educate people about the Muslim world or about Muslims or about Arabs. You know, oftentimes people don't realize there are 22 Arab countries that, you know, define the Arab world. But also we hear about the Levant area, we hear about Dubai and beautiful buildings and crazy economic situation there. And then we hear about, you know, North Africa and that sort of thing. But we don't really dissect this complex reality which is the Arab and Muslim world. And, and oftentimes, although our work aims to do great things, we do perpetuate a type of idea that there is an Arab or a Muslim uh, in our work. So, so a lot of what I do is trying to dig below that and deconstruct those types of narratives and realities and, and engage people on those levels to really realize that there are diverse groups within diverse groups and furthermore within those diverse groups. Um, so that brings me to my second point with my fantasy work is that we really need to try to reach beyond the choir in some of what we do. And you guys you know, are doing great work and that you do not necessarily have your, your audience, which is a built-in audience. But oftentimes, cultural initiatives speak to those who are willing to receive our message. And how do we get our messages across to the diverse audi audiences? And we need to engage with sort of a difference and constructively engage people who have different ideological backgrounds than, our, than ourselves. We need to get to a place where we can engage people who may not come to dialogue groups like this or who may be completely opposed to the work which we are doing. Because those are the people that are committing hate crimes, furthering negativity, and breeding hate. It's not the people in this room, definitely. Um, so I, I, we'll wrap up what I'm saying with just a, kind of a summary uh, of a quote that I find that really, I feel, beautifully summarizes um, diversity in all its forms. Um, and this can be applicable to the institutional level, on the individual level, but also on government levels and, and movements, specific movements taking place. So it's, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. And watch your character, because they become your destiny. I brought back the I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I want to just, we're going to turn to questions in a minute, but a couple of follow-ups here. Um, Damien, I wanted to ask you about, I know that you experienced some 